Marco Amigo. Uh, he's, uh, he's doing a workshop here at time at the moment um, uh, on Isadora, working with Isadora. And today is the second day, tomorrow is the last day. Um, and tonight he will uh, tell a little bit more about his work. Uh, I think maybe about the track range and maybe also something about Isadora.
finishing up there. And in true Stein tradition, it was made out of radio control cars that I hacked out somehow and made into a sensor that the dancers could wear on their body. And at that moment, when a dancer could take her arm and go, boom, I just thought that was the most amazing thing that was possible. And of course, I don't know if I knew why, I, but it, there was something about it that appealed to me. And I think that a lot of people in this field had the same feeling. We were drawn to this ability somehow that the performer's bodies were being extended and moving into the realm of the computer. And this is what Taku talked about today, about the interface between, uh, we had a lecture today from the Stein people for our, our workshop. And he talked about you know, what decisions you make in terms of interfacing these things and why you make those decisions. But in the end, I think that at the beginning, it was just bomb. That was fantastic. So it was in 1996, that uh, 12 years ago, as I said, that I came here. And two important things happened. Um, the first thing was that I had created a software with Mort Subotnik called Interactor, which was an early MIDI-based uh, uh, interactive uh, language, patch-based language, much like Max or you know, different softwares you've seen, I suppose. And it was then when I came to Stein that Tom Meyer was here, and he was doing the initial push to finish Imagine, which was a video processing software, I think maybe one of the first that ran on personal computers certainly. And of course I couldn't believe my eyes when you're sitting there in front of the old Mac Quadra, whatever it was, 480 or whatever the number was. And he was able to in real time manipulate these images. And I, I, I was really uh, so impressed by this that we went immediately adopted it and made it uh, used to imagine for one of our shows. But there was a, a lot about it that didn't suit my particular artistic practice. There were things that I wanted it to do, things that I mainly had in, or in Interactor that I didn't, didn't see in, in uh, Imagine. And so really it was at the moment of seeing Imagine that indirectly, uh, three years later, my push to create Isadora, which is the interactive software that I'm here teaching, was born. And uh, I didn't know that it would become anything more than something for me to use, but in the end it has turned out that there are really, um, you know, there's uh, hundreds of artists around the world who now use it, so this is a sort of a, a, a kind of amazing uh, development that came uh, with this inspiration from being here. But maybe the more important story that I have to tell is, and I, and I want to say his name right, but there's a fellow who works here as, an, as a kind of engineer, and I should say artist engineer, because I think they're all like that here, but his name is Joachim, is that right? Yeah. Yeah? Okay. Yes. And it was very funny, Don and I were here for the first couple days, and I, I think in the first two or three days, four of the other resident artists asked me if Joachim had taken me to his room. And I didn't know what that meant, and no one really said what it meant, but they kept asking me. So finally I went to him, and I asked if I could see his room, and he immediately, I guess, knew what I meant, and he said, yes, I will take you. And I think at that time, it used, it used to be up in the attic, I'm not sure, but I remember climbing some very intense stairs, it seems like, to get there. Maybe, I heard it's in the basement now, but yeah. in any case, we go up there, and I, he opens the door, and it's this like museum of the most amazing collection of 1960s and 70s and maybe early 80s analog synthesizers you've ever seen, R2600 and Moogs and all this stuff. It's really unbelievable. As a composer, it's, you're just walking into this incredible trove of stuff. So he has, and, and it's very important to remember that, you know, we're just really beginning to embrace the notion of using digital computers. I mean, I mean, I had been doing it for some years then, but it was, it was tough, you know, it was, it was early on in the process. And in any case, he has everything connected to an analog sequencer, and he fires it all up, and it's making this great music, and it's like 160 beat per minute kind of cool house music. I don't know exactly how to describe it, but it was great. And he's playing the music for me, and I'm looking at this, and being as I'm here working on, on digital technology and using computers, and I asked him, I said, I said, wouldn't it be easier if you had a computer running this instead of that old analog synthesizer? And he looked a little bit shocked and he said no. And he was very serious in his response. He said, and I said, why is that? And he said, because it's always the same. And that was when I had, I think it actually wasn't at that moment, I think it was a month later when my a little light bulb went above my head. Because what he said was really important. It's that the thing about digital media is that when you send a file to him, and he sends it to you, and so on through the room, you send an MP3 file, either it doesn't get there at all, or when it arrives, 
every single bit is in the same order it was. It's precisely the same. And being someone who works with dance and is especially interested in live performance, the notion that we were going to have these streams of bits that were exactly the same in every show made no sense to me. Because the beauty of live performance is that you walk in and you never know what's going to happen. Every night is different, and certainly I can tell you from being a performer myself in some pieces, and certainly from our dancers, that every single night they walk out there and the way the audience feels is different, and the experiences they have that day are different. And it's really the sense of liveness that comes from being on stage and interacting with that feeling of the audience is, is really quite real. And my feeling became that we had to find ways, or maybe the explanation for what I was already doing was, I wanted to find ways to link the liveness, the chaos of the body of the dancer. And when I say chaos, I mean that every night when they do their arm like this, where they go bong, uh, which hopefully we've gone beyond bong. But anyway, when they do that, it's going to be a slightly different. And that's the beauty of, uh, of I think, trying to find ways to do this sort of thing. So, so actually, that was quite a significant moment. And so I really refer to these things. Those bits that are unchanging, I think of as dead media. It's, it's sitting there and it's unchanging. And the bits that are flipping, as I flipped at the beginning there in, uh, in that little demonstration, are more like li living media or live media that are somehow linked to something organic, something analog, the body of the dancer being analog. And I, I want to be careful. I say the word chaos because I like that word, but I think that when I say chaos, it's really a chaos within a realm of possibility. Uh, again, as was talked about uh, uh, by Tucker today, we talked about building instruments, and I've always seen myself as an instrument builder in terms of the interactive systems that I'm creating. And, and so um, our performers really work with these devices and learn how to play them and understand every aspect of them. So in their own way, they become virtuosi in their ability to perform them. Um, and that's part of, of the process of making the work. They have to learn how to do that. So, um, so that's kind of a little background. And what I want to do is I want to dive back. I, sort of, I think we can sort of say that, or I can sort of say that Troika Ranch has had three general phases in terms of the aesthetic kinds of work or the, the, the kind of style, maybe, we should say, of how, what they've been producing. And I want to briefly talk about a couple of those older places we were, and then I want to spend some time talking about where we're at now, uh, with, especially with the new piece that we're developing. So, um, so going back to this mini damage device, I want to show a couple of clips from a piece called In Plane. This was a, a piece that I think a lot of people recognize as, as somehow important because I think it brought together uh, a strong dance work with interactivity that seemed to mean something. And this was using the mini dancer system. And just to explain that very briefly, um, there were uh, bend sensors at eight points on the body, the wrists, the elbows, the hips, and the knees. And all of those were being wirelessly transmitted to the computer where that allowed Don uh, to control both the music and in fact, we were controlling video in the most rudimentary way you can think of because in those day, days, we were using an extremely ex exciting and exotic technology called the laser disc. And, um, and so basically what we were able to do was we could actually jump from one place to another and control the speed and the direction of the disc. Although I must say, I have some fondness for that device because unlike all the video we have today, it was absolutely uncompressed. And there was something really great about it because it looked very good, actually. It's sometimes better uh, than the stuff we have today. So um, I want to show uh, a couple of those. And I, so in this first phase of what we were thinking about, and I think this was pretty common in those days, um, really we were, we were really interested in this tension between the electronic and the organic. Um, you know, that there's a kind of general feeling, you know, we're questioning technology, saying that technological advancements are something potentially dangerous, that we, could, we have to watch out for them and that they could impose uh, limitations on the nature of being human. So I think that that's a fairly common theme from those days, maybe. And uh, so let me show you uh, just two sections from this. And I'm wondering if, if it's possible for when we show the clips to turn the lights down a little bit. Is, there, is yeah. that easy to do? Or? Yeah. Okay. Because th these are, the documentation is not very good and it's awfully dark, so I have, you have to forget about that. Okay, here we go.
Okay, so that's just the introduction of the piece. I'm going to jump to a section that's a little bit later. <laughs>
projection screen was actually 20 uh, 2 meter by 0.75 meter uh, uh, we, they were actually supposed to be windows, you can sort of see the panes open in some of them, and so even though the image was on the back wall we broke it into pieces, and that was actually very successful because the important thing that we discovered at that moment was that there's always this issue with dance about putting the image with the dancer and where is your focus and how are you able to look at it but since we had these individual panes we could put images in just one of them. And since that object is 2 meters and 0.75, that's basically me. It's a human being-sized uh, rectangle. And so in fact, you start seeing that it's possible to really make a duet, to make a kind of combination between this single frame, if you like, or and the, and the live performer. Of course, here, there's a few. I mean, the video here is very simple. It's just a simple video delay from a wireless camera that's down on the floor by those glasses that she's dancing in front of. But um, in any case, uh, there was really this really cinematic approach. And, and really, I would say that all of these little these pieces in this middle period have to do with kind of peering into the window of the psyche of a character, or peering into the some kind of mental condition or mental state. And this way, they're quite narrative. Um, they're not very conceptual. There were always backstories behind them. And so that's something um, that's something that changed, I think, from the earlier stuff that we did. So now I, I want to go on and talk about the two most recent things: the, the the piece, the last piece we've completed, and the piece we're working on now. That's where we spent most of my time tonight. Um, the last piece we did was called uh, the, that we've completed was called Sixteen Revolutions. And in this, I, uh, we decided to not work with the MIDI dancer any longer because one thing that's actually interesting to look at this choreography is that it, obviously like any instrument, requires a certain kind of physicality to work. If you move like this, nothing happens. You have to flex those limbs. And you can see this kind of uh, chaotic, crazy choreography that Dawn was doing had all of that flexion in it. Of course, she knew how the device worked really, really well and could leverage that knowledge to be able to really play it. But it's just like a trombone or a violin. You have to approach it in a particular uh, physical way to be able, a, a certain kind of physical way, to make it work. And so that meant that the choreography had a certain look to it, I think. And one of the reasons we got interested in moving beyond the mini dancer was we wanted to try using camera tracking to see if we could get beyond some of those limitations. And also, I wanted to see if it was possible to start making, uh, to sort of start moving a little bit beyond mapping as an idea. I think that mapping is how it's been done from the very beginning. That's the bong. Or even in the beginning of any plane where she's kind of just flexing her limbs slowly, she's essentially mixing eight tracks of audio with the volume each connected to each one of these sensors. And so she's like a human mixing console at that moment. That's how the, the music is being created. 
So we decided to do that. So I'm going to play this little clip that gives the kind of technical background about the piece, and then I'll, I'll, I'll talk about the piece itself in terms of the aesthetics in a moment. Real-time motion tracking allows the dancers to interactively manipulate the digital media as they perform 16 revolutions. The motion tracking features of IsWeb are combined with the analysis and image generation capabilities of Isadora, the real-time media manipulation software designed by artistic director Mark Coniglio. The stage environment consists of a cyclorama filled with infrared light and a single infrared camera located downstage. As the dancers move in front of the cyclorama, the camera sees a black silhouette. IsWeb analyzes this image, generating a 12-point skeleton that tracks the movement of their torso and limbs. The position and trajectory of each point is sent from IsWeb to Isadora over a local area network. There, the path of each point is analyzed using the gesture module, measuring the straightness, curvature, complexity, path length, velocity, and other parameters. These measurements are then used to generate the visuals and to manipulate aspects of the sonic score, providing an intimate relationship between the performer and the accompanying media. Our research has focused on sensing the quality of a gesture, meaning, we wanted to quantify parameters that relate closely to the viewer's experience of a gesture. When analyzing a single path, some parameters are easily quantifiable, like velocity or acceleration. Others with subjective labels like simple, complex, jittery, angular are less obvious. A special Isadora module called Gesture was created to break the path of each point tracked by IsWeb into meaningful units, represented here by different colors and to perform an analysis on these paths. By carefully linking these measurements to the visual and oral score, a rich network of interactive control is offered to the performers. Okay, so, so that's sort of the background on the technology. The piece itself, for us, what we were thinking about, we were interested in the kind of uh, <coughs> tension in ourselves between our animal nature and our, um, our uh, nature as human beings. Um, and we're trying to find ways to expose those relationships in the piece. Now, what I'm going to do, of course, I, don't, I didn't, I'm a, I'm a bad demonstrator because I left one of my, didn't open my DVD player, just a second. So, what I want to show you is just a few, I'm going to show you a few clips from this one. Um, Get it to behave and show up over here. Can you do it? Can you do it? Okay. So, I'm go here. Um, I'm going to turn the sound up quite a bit for this first one because I, I'm going to let this play. It's about a three minute section. This is the very beginning of the piece that I'm about to play. And uh, I think it will make clear some of the basic capabilities of the tracking.
literal uh, introduction. Uh, we see this as starting with, in our minds, we saw it as a cell, a fish, uh, an animal, and a human being. And that was a little, it was, I had written on a note card, history of evolution in two minutes. And so that was the realization of that idea. And that's the introduction of the piece. But I think that the really important moment in this comes, there's two important moments. One, it served, a, it served another purpose, which is, of course, to expose the notion of how the tracking's happening to the audience. Um, I, I think that for Don and I, we never put program notes in anymore about this stuff and the technology. But we do feel it's important that people have a sense of what's going on. And my feeling about it is, is if they see this and they get it, and I think a lot of people did in this particular case, and they're with you and they understand that this is coming from the performers, that's fantastic because they have a deeper understanding of what's happening uh, in terms of the live media production. If they don't get it, that's okay too, because the artwork has to stand on its own anyway. So, um, uh, but the other thing uh, was that there's an important moment when that line comes in and sort of she retreats to the table because the line is not a, a perfectly straight line that sort of suggests infinity like that is not something that exists in nature. It is, um, it is, an, it is a construct of the human intellect. As is, I see the table as a representation of kind of intellectual ideas. It's a kind of technology. And so in fact, the, that it starts this idea in the piece that the graphics themselves represent to a certain extent this imposition of the human intellect on the on the, the characters that are in the piece. Now, I'll go ahead to and oh, and let me just back up to say one other thing about the technology. So it's also quite lovely that because that we're using this infrared tracking idea, where the back wall is actually brightly, brightly lit with infrared light, that of course this camera and your eyes cannot see, but the tracking camera sees it perfectly well. And so that means that we can, even with stage lighting turned on, accurately and robustly track the performers uh, and project into the same space in which they're performing. And that's quite also quite a, significant, um, uh, quite a significant thing to be able to do. Although I must say, in critique of our own work, I, it, the fact that we went back to an image on the back wall felt like a step backward to me. It, it worked in terms of... Uh, what we were able to do, it allowed us to do use this kind of great image projection technology, but I must say that it's not something I really wanted to go back to because this idea of the smaller screens and how we could relate them to the dancers and keep the focus balanced was really working in this in Future of Memory and the piece that came after called Surfacing. So that was also an interesting um, way direction that we went into. So I'll play a little bit of this, just a little bit of this section. Because the other thing that starts happening with these graphics is that they start to, uh, as you can see, it's the video projectors are also very important as light sources. They're the things that are kind of revealing or not revealing, as the case may be, these people. And we really saw this as the two sides of the, of the person, both that animal side and that intellectual side, that we were showing and revealing them. But this is just a, another little section of the piece. And all the music's being controlled. Uh, as well as this tracking. And in, in the actual piece, we do it in quadraphonic, so there's quite a nice spatialization happening as well. That's actually an important moment that I just want to wait. Let me just mention, mention that. Stop, stop, stop. That moment was not something that Don choreographed. In a rehearsal, he knew that that light was just a little thin line on his face, and he just turned and he put one eye into it and he addressed the audience. And I think it's worth mentioning because 
That's the thing that happens that I'm so pleased with with our performers and the way they've dug into this. They really understand what's going on and what the audience is seeing. I mean, this is about a relationship of really seeing into him. And when he turns his eye and does that look at the audience, it's really quite a dramatic moment. And he did it because he understood where that line was and what it meant that you could see his one eye. And I just, it, it may seem small, but, and it's hard to really feel it on the video, but really it's quite a strong moment in, in, the, in the dance when that happens. Okay, just a little bit more of this. So, you know, using these silhouettes in that moment like that, this question starts to come up. You see them, but you don't see them, but yet you see this representation of them, and you're starting to play with this notion of what's happening. Now, I want to go on to the, the more recent key, so I'm going to skip through several things. I just want to show you um, uh, one last section. So, there's, a, there's quite a long section where they're located at this table. It's about 12 minutes long, and it's quite... Uh, austere in that not much happens. They're there for quite a long time. And you've really felt the tension of these characters being stuck in this place. And so finally, and, and everything up to that point has been a straight line, one way or the other. There's been multiple straight lines. You've seen the other straight lines that I indicated to you. But for the first time in the piece, finally someone stands up and takes action. Someone actually takes a moment and leaves this intellectual world and it lets out some of that animal emotion, if you will. And so this particular section, which is kind of one of the climactic sections of the piece, uh, shows that. I don't know if I can get it there. And this is using the tracking thing that I showed you in the little clip before.
physician Daniel Shorno, who works here today, brought up this notion that why lots of people abandon imagery, as I had shown you in the other pieces, imagery of, of cinematic imagery for graphics like this. And we were talking about the possibility of simply a reaction against um, the notion of imagery because it had been done so much, you know, in the 90s, and uh, and that you know many, and also the opportunity became possible to actually do it. So that's 16 revolutions, and I think that. Um, uh, there were a lot of things about it that I, I was quite proud of in the way that it worked. I still question this using of the back wall, though, because I think it's clear, especially with, and this is something I want to talk about again in a moment, with imagery this compelling, I mean, people often commented on this section, oh, it's so beautiful and it's amazing and all these sorts of things that we hear. But in fact, you know, there's tension between where is the focus? Is the focus on the performer or is the focus on the image? And in this world, when you're putting such a big image on the screen, it's clear that it's almost always on the screen. The dancer is almost a subsidiary image as part of the bigger image, which isn't necessarily bad in some cases, but I think perhaps in this moment it wasn't so good. But it is what it is, and I'm still quite happy with the way in which the interaction worked, the way the sounds were produced, and that sort of thing. So now I want to take you in the last uh, 10, 10 or 12 minutes here into the piece that we're making now. Um, and. I'm going to start by saying that I we've done 16 revolutions, and I started thinking about the next thing that I'd like to do. And actually, uh, I'll need the lights on for this because I'm going to do some live stuff here. Um, so I started investigating a lot of uh, code on the web that's used. That's actually a good brightness, probably. Uh, some code on the web that uh, does representations of real things water, string. I mean, there's millions of algorithms like this. You know, there's people in Hollywood whose only job is to make hair that looks real. You know, it's actually like a full-time job, if not for one person, for several, for a team. And um, the thing that's interesting about this stuff is that that's what everyone typically tries to do, is to make it look real. And what I got interested in was taking these systems and misusing them by setting the parameters all wrong. So uh, I can just show you. It's probably easier to show you than that. So here's what was a, a fairly general algorithm for representing water. show you a few ways that it can look. Here's, a, here's one that's more like water, I think. Right. But if you start messing around with the parameters, see there it's more like, it's more like the real thing. But if you start doing this one, because what I've done is I've changed the viscosity of the surface tension of the water to be all wrong. And so when I do it, it starts distorting and it just explodes into these uh, really interesting shapes. Okay? So that's one little example of that. And then another example, which I'm going to try to do um, this very elegant piece of a cup, because I'm doing it, I'm going to track that. Wait. So let's see if this one will behave for me. Uh, no, you know what? I'm going to switch to the internal camera and just track my face. That will work better. see my face, but I don't see it. Oh, here. There. Okay, so basically, it's what it's doing is these objects are tracking my face. And right now, uh, these are, this is a string simulation. My face is a point of anti-gravity. Normally, the gravity all hangs down. They want the strings to go down, so it looks like real string. But instead, my face is pushing those things away because it's negative gravity. Right? So, but then it started, when you really start messing around with the parameters and making them really wrong, it starts to get super interesting. Now, let's see if I can get this one to go. All right, this one's actually a little bit more traditional in the sense that 
now my face is a point of gravity and it's attracting them. Yeah. I also like, there's an error in the algorithm where if I stand still for a second, you'll see they start making these incredible bundles and stars. Yeah. So it's still realistic though. It almost looks like maybe it's in water and there's something being pulled along in there. And, but then, if you start doing something like this, where the string has no weight, which is impossible, then I think it really starts to get interesting. Okay, so there's some interesting ha things happening here. And one of the things that I intended to do with this was my idea was, what if we thought about these as strings of an instrument? And if we could take an imaginary pickup, like a sensor, if you will, an imaginary one, and attach it to one of those strings, so that we could measure the speed, the velocity, the direction, all kinds of properties of its movement. And if we could have maybe several dozen of those sensors in the system, I think this could be. A, I think this. This is the next thing I would like to try with this: is to use the, the way in which this stuff is moving and reacting as a way of manipulating sound parameters or visual parameters. Because the, the thing that I like about this is that is that it's not a direct mapping. This is one of the ways of getting beyond the mapping that I was talking about. Because when you disturb the system, I mean, I can get out of the frame. And it still has a lot of information. It's generating a lot of information based on the way I disturbed it and set it into motion. So it actually is, it's related to the movement that I'm doing, but it's not directly related to the movement I'm doing. It has a kind of quote unquote intelligence. I use that quite loosely. So this was uh, getting very, very interesting to me. Now, I'm going to show you a little demo only because it features a kind of interesting technology that maybe you'd like to know about. Um, but I have to tell you, this is not choreography. We were invited to give a demo to Bjork 24 hours before it was supposed to happen, and we had to whip something up. And this is absolutely just one of the a dancer we know. It's not even somebody who works with us regularly. Came in, and we just told her to do a few things. It really is not choreography, I have to say that. But just so you know what's happening, this thing, there's a thing called the eyeliner. Do any of you know what Pepper's Ghost is? Pepper's Ghost is the illusion they used to do in the 16 or 1700s. It's a piece of glass. If you're the audience, there's a piece of glass here. I'm here, and off stage is someone who's in a ghostly costume. They turn a light on, and that person, it reflects in the glass, and you see them as a ghost floating there, even though they're not really there, right? Well, these eyeliner people have developed a patented technology for putting microfine pieces of metal or little metallic particles into a, a sheet of clear plastic that can be made as big as a proscenium stage. And so they just updated the idea of Pepper's Ghost. But what they've done in typical installations is they mount it in the theater like this, and they put a white floor in a place where you can't see it in the orchestra pit, and then they can project images that really float on top of the performers. So anyway, this little quick demo for Bjork allowed us to try this technology out with what you had just seen. So I'm just going to show you a very brief section of that.
if you would see it live, it's really quite magical how the images float on top of the bodies of performers. So, and, and I wanted to show that only because, you know, there were lots of oohs and ahs when we showed that, even though the choreography was not choreography, as I said. And, um, and that was all well and good, but this leads into the final part of my talk, because I want to describe the process that we began with Loop Diver and what happened to this imagery as a result. Now, unlike all the rest of Troika Ranch's pieces, Loop Diver was really quite different. We decided against any kind of narrative, any kind of anything having to do with story, and really just wanted to start with a pure process. And the process that we came up with, we became interested in, in looping as a notion. And so I created a module in Isadora that allowed um, us to create really complicated looping structures uh, where you can have not just a standard loop, but one that changes size and moves around and does a lot of different things in terms of the way that the loop is created. And so, not really knowing if this would work, we had a two-month period of work in New York, and we sat out to um, do a lot of dance improvisations. Dawn would then take this tool I made her and made the loops, looping the, the she'd take the improv videos, loop it using this module, and then turn the screen around, and the dancers would learn this material. And so that's the process. And I'm going to let you see a little bit what that looks like. I'm going to show you, this is absolutely raw improv rehearsal footage, and I'll show you how we looped it and how it came out in the actual show. Here's that same material run through the module in Isadora that allowed the, the looping to happen. Ready? there's edits too, that's part of it, right? And so uh, Dawn would render these out and give them to the dancers and they'd learn them. Now I'm going to jump ahead to the end of that two months and let you see how that particular section turned out in the actual piece. And so, I'll yeah, just play it. Half an hour. 
And then we sent them each into an individual room with a video camera, and they spoke improvisationally for 40 minutes. This is a way for us to generate material. And in every single one of those videotapes, the dancers talked about oppression, attack, violence, pain. And also, it was very interesting, all six of them mentioned the bird at a certain point in their talk. And so, because you, know, you have to realize, all of this, what we're I'm talking about doing is in the first week or 10 days of this two months. And we really, we, and also their mood was not good. And what we really started to see was that this absolutely inorganic movement was a kind of violent attack on the natural way that the dancers moved. And it was affecting them psychologically. And it was having this really dramatic impact. And I have to also include um, uh, our, our dramaturg, Peter Salas, who was the first time we worked with a dramaturg. We really started digging into this idea, and it just became clear suddenly that the real theme of this piece was about violence, about the impact of violence, the resonance of violence, and how one moves past it. Because in fact, when we are, you've, uh, you've, I know you've all experienced this on a micro level, and maybe you've seen it on a macro level, where Something really terrible happens to someone, and they get locked in a pattern of either destructive behavior or behavior where they're out of control. And, uh, and we all know that if you see someone on the street, at, on, a, on a bench, going like this, this means that there's some kind of psychological disturbance going. They're in this little loop. And so somehow, all of this kind of came together, that these loops were a place of being psychologically trapped in the resonance of that violence, and that the piece was about what, where that came from and how they were going to move past it in a very abstract, non-narrative way that wasn't going to tell a story. And so it was at that moment, when they, this, this emerged about two weeks into the residency, and I'm looking at that imagery, which I just showed you, and I absolutely realized that I had to throw it away. And the reason for that was, as I talked about in 16 Revolutions, and I will say in general, most of the work that I have seen that involves 3D computer graphics of one form or another, I think the general word that you can use to describe it is beautiful. I don't, I can't think of a piece except for one, I'll give an example in a moment. It was only one piece I've seen where I felt that that um, happened, uh, where I saw something disturbing. And I wasn't yet prepared, I had not found the disturbing in this imagery that I was developing. And so I absolutely just threw it out and started over. And you saw some of the video that ended up being in the piece, which was actually videotaped at an abandoned psychiatric institute on Long Island that I broke into because I heard, I saw some pictures from some other urban explorers who had been there. And that, I, I'm not sure if that worked either. But the most important thing was, I think that, I think that it's really important when you're making this work with technology, or I think I've come to know as an, as an artist that if you can't let go of, I mean, it's hard for me. I put a lot of work into that stuff. But if you can't let go of it and say, that is not serving the needs of this piece and is not expressing the idea that is germane to this piece, then I think you're in trouble. So in that sense, I was quite happy uh, that I had the courage to, to do so. Um, so and let me just say, the example I wanted to give is an artist who was originally from Austria who now lives in New York called Kurt Henschlager. And he has a piece called Feed, and has, I don't know if anybody's seen it. Um, okay, cool. And, and in that piece, he's got these 3D bodies. They're kind of uh, androgynous bodies, and they're floating in space, and they're, they're, they're very featureless. But the thing that starts happening, if I can imitate it, is that the bodies start going like this. And there's nothing, you don't see anything impacting them. But your inference is, is that they're being struck by something. And that was the other insight that I think we, we had about this, is this is what I want to be able to deal with. I want to come back to this imagery. I want to see if there's a way. But what I found out in that moment was that things are only disturbing when they happen to a body. And, and when, I, when I say that, we were making this piece at a new art center that's four blocks south of Ground Zero. And I was smoking a cigarette outside one day, um, looking at the empty space that used to be the trade center. And it occurred to me in thinking about this idea that if those buildings had fallen and no one had been in them, it, it wouldn't have meant much. It would have been upsetting in a way or whatever, but no one would have cared. But again, being in New York when that happened, and for anyone who witnessed any of the video, when that building fell, 
you became one of those people temporarily. And that's why it's so incredibly disturbing. And, and so this has really become my goal now in working on this piece in terms, because I feel like the choreographic process we're on is very interesting. And in fact, for the first time probably in the history of Troika Ranch, I think Dawn is teaching a technique to our dancers. She's identified this moving technique, and it's now becoming a thing that they are learning. And I have to say it's quite interesting because we came back for, to work on some new material with two of those dancers, because you can't believe how time consuming this process was for them to precisely replicate these moves, because they, they really did it. But it was extremely time consuming. And uh, we came back from this rehearsal, and suddenly they were getting it done twice as fast when I realized they had been taught a technique of how to learn this material, and they were doing it faster than they used to. And that was really fascinating for me. So, but I think my own personal goal, because I, uh, in terms of, because I think I actually found this disturbing also in the music to a certain extent, not so much in this particular section, but in other sections, it's quite a strong uh, statement of the music. But I want to see if we can find a way to t find a way to make that imagery have that sense of being disturbing. And I think that the link I have to find is a relationship to a body. And I'm not sure where that is yet, but that's the, the thing that I'm seeking. And uh, so, I think that's enough. Um, that's basically where we are now in our process. This new piece, which for the moment we're calling Loop Diver, I don't know if we'll change the name, but the piece will premiere in the fall of 2009, so have a fair amount of time to be able to work on it and hopefully make those discoveries. And um, so, and I didn't actually talk much about Isadora because I was really here mostly to talk about Troika Ranch, but I think that it's probably been a long enough time of me talking and I'd be happy to take some questions. And also, if you, if people are interested, I think we can, you know, take a break. And if you want a little bit more insight into the software itself, I'm really happy to do that. Uh, but maybe it's good to take a moment for some questions and a short break. Yeah. So, any questions? Yeah. yeah. Um, so, you were talking about getting away from mapping and looking at um, quality, um, yeah, quality of data, quality of movement. Um, could you talk a little bit more about that, sort of the discoveries you made of moving away from mapping, and also sort of the feedback of the performer, of how the performers dealt with sort of the representation of this new kind of data or, um, uh, that you were extracting? Well, I can't say I can't say that I got that far in 16 revolutions. The the things that went beyond, I mean, because obviously even in the stuff you saw, there's a lot of mapping mm -hmm. it's still going on. Yeah, but. But some of the things that I did that I think succeeded were these qualities of sort of smooth or lyrical, if you like, and complicated. You know, you see in the one solo with the, with the painting behind her, she does this thing like this for a little while, and a certain sound emerges. So it actually, I was starting to be successful at picking that up. At a certain point, I had to get back to writing music and finishing the piece. What I had started to experiment with, which I had, had, have essentially left for that moment, was I started using fuzzy logic because the real problem is, the real problem is it's one thing to do it with this limb, but what does it mean if you're doing this and that? Because that's contrary information, and you have to have a system to start making decisions about that. Now I did some initial experiments using fuzzy logic, which is a way of making decision making where it's not just on and off, but it's sort of uh, how confident are you that it's happening to aggregate the information from the different limbs and to see if I could start making sense of it. But basically, I kind of came to a stopping point mostly because I just had to finish the piece in terms of the rest of the stuff that I was doing. So that's where we left it. Um, the funding for this new piece is through a, a thing in the United States called Creative Campus. And the point of it is to use an arts group to bring together parts of a university campus that wouldn't normally work together. So I have a team of fairly bright computer scientists that are going to help me work on this problem because I must say, I'm quite a good programmer, I made Isadora and all that sort of thing. But I had gotten to a kind of limit in my knowledge about certain things when it comes to uh, technologies like hidden Markov models that I think are going to figure to be quite important in this process. And they actually are experts at this. So I'm hoping, I, I don't know, but it's, it's really a big question for me in Loop Diver how this really fits in, this kind, of t this kind of tracking technology. I mean, also, I didn't really talk a lot about the staging of that piece, but that's a whole different picture. Um, just to let you know, that if this is the stage here like this, then there's three screens, like so, and the audience is along here. So in fact, the screens are perpendicular to the audience, which was quite another strong statement against that back wall idea. 
And how to make that imagery fit in and to make the tracking meaningful in that configuration, I'm not positive yet about what this all means. It's really, I, I really feel, I feel a bit lost in a really nice way. Let me put it that way. So to answer your question, I only got to a certain level of a few things that I was doing where I achieved some of these kinds of more indirect uh, relationships. But it, it, a lot of it was still mapping. And I, but I'm curious about it. And this is why I talked about this idea of putting little uh, imaginary uh, pickups on these virtual systems. Because they do have this, uh, because of the rule sets of how they're developed, they have a kind of uh, uh, intelligence in a way, or a way of responding to disturbances. And so somehow there's, there's something there that might work. I don't know. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, uh, in this piece where the dancer created the web behind her mm -hmm. or in the background, mm -hmm. uh, at some point the web was kind of disintegrating. Yeah. How did that happen? Well, whenever she, whenever she made a very high velocity move with one of her limbs, uh, it was like it would grab a few of them and toss them inside of the computer. So she knew that if she was doing stuff that was like this, it was all going to stay there. But if she did one of those, then a group of them were going to fly off <coughs> in that direction because it was measuring the velocity and angle with which she was moving all of her limbs and could do that. Yeah, I think that was really interesting because otherwise it's it's kind of uh, what you can understand as the audience, as the dancers moving, is creating the thread, but you don't understand how it's falling apart. And yeah. I think that's, that's, yeah, that makes it much more interesting. Mm -hmm. yeah. And there were also uh, like some uh, fields in the end, there were some, uh, um, some rectangles coming Yeah, down. that's the set. It's a, it, the set is made out of plastic. Okay. And uh, it makes a kind of, there's strips of it, but it makes a kind of tunnel around the whole space. And so that's what you were seeing. Okay. Yes? How long were the, the loops that they, the movement loops? I mean, it's like. How long were the. The, the, the movement loops of which you put the, the loop. Okay, well, okay, so this um, this thing that I played in the background a minute ago yeah. is about five, the whole the whole duet is about five minutes long, I think. The original material yeah. was about 35 seconds. That's what I mean. Yeah. And you mean by edits, those, the, the, the cuts that you, those you Well, did. anytime, anytime, um, here, if I go back and jump into this a little bit. Um, let's see here. How oh, is this going to behave or not? So, no, see when she, there, that was one of them. You yeah. see how he stepped? Whenever you see those kinds of movements, that's when they're trying to accomplish one of those edits. He's going to do it again there. You see, and they both do it at the same time because they were dancing the duet together when it was filmed. But, but uh, could you just find the end of the video by hand? Made the cut? No, there's a... I it's, a part of, it's part of your variation. Yeah, here, I'll show you. This is the module in Isadora. And if you double click it, hopefully it will appear. Oh, it's over here. Hold on. This is the program. This is the loop structure that Dawn created for this solo, for this duet. And so it's saying that we're going to play for two seconds. And then it's, and then it's going to, so now it's at two seconds. It actually jumps to three seconds. So it skips a second. It plays for two okay, more seconds. Okay, so that's in other words, it's part of the... Yeah, the edits are part of it. I mean, it doesn't have to be that. Some of them are palindrome loops, where it, instead of, um, I mean, I can, let me just illustrate it for you, actually. Here, hold on a second. Um, Before you go on, I ask you, why do you call them edits? Well, because it's a point where you, there's a discontinuity in oh, the video, yeah, that's, that's right? True. Yeah, where I mean, where it's not it's not uh, going from one to the other. So like, if I just disconnect this one for a second, let me just I'll just do this very briefly. Okay, which movie is this? Number eight. Sorry, I have to do this weird because I'm looking at the I don't have a mirroring. <laughs> Okay, so for instance, let's start, let's start with, I make a duration of 0.2 seconds, and I'm going to loop that 20 times. Oops, let me 
and said, sorry. Okay, so I think, right, there's, now that was the same piece of material over and over and over again. That's a very traditional loop, right? Now, if I take this and I set it to palindrome, now it looks like this. Wait, let's start it over. Sorry, one other change. Let's see. Right? So now it's the same, it's still the same material, but it's going back and forth. But watch what happens if, on the editor, instead of just playing the same piece of material, I tell it to shift by a tenth of a second down, you know, towards the end of the movie each time it repeats. Now it looks like this. And more and more of the material is being revealed because the loop is moving along through the piece. So by changing these various parameters, there's a lot of different ways in which you can make this happen. And it's quite a, a rich uh, structure for doing this. And the, but the thing that's very interesting too is that people who saw this piece are kind of fans of Trigger Ranch, and especially fans of the technology. Some of them were really angry with us because they didn't see the stuff they saw in 16 Revolutions. And the thing that was so interesting to me about it is every movement in this piece is dictated by a computer algorithm. Mm -hmm. And yet, because they didn't see it in front of them in their eyes, they were all, some of them, I should say, were disappointed by the, the, the fact that it wasn't obvious that way, that they didn't get those kind of pretty pictures and everything like that. So that was quite interesting to me, too. Because, in fact, it really is extremely rigorous in terms of the algorithms that were used. Yes? So from that, you could you say that, that you were composing when you were starting to write this list of instructions to how the video is going to be moving around, right? Mm -hmm. Just like you did now. It's, could you call that a way of composing in, in a certain way, like a composer? A I, I, or a I, I think, first of all, it should be clear that Dawn, the choreographer, did that, not me. Uh -huh. But um, yes, I, I mean, she sat for hours um, developing mm -hmm. these, these things and based on her own interest in what she saw in the movement material she had to work with. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was a strange organic process because the improvisations were quite all over the place. I mean, we just spent days, you know, just trying everything and capturing it all. And then she had to sift through it mm -hmm. and figure out how she was going to loop it. But I would say definitely it's a form of composition, certainly, because she's making the decisions. The only thing I'll say about that is that I'm going to update this editor because the problem with it right now is, if you change one loop early on in the thing, the rest of it is completely destroyed. Like Because everything shifts by a little bit, and it's absolutely not what you thought it was. And so it's quite limiting. I mean, really, the time that she spent on it was really unbelievable. Because to get these things back, once she lost them by making an edit early, took a long time. So uh, that was quite painful for her. And she has requested uh, an update. So I'm going to supply that to her. Did yeah. You, did you ever get compared to Chris Cornell? He did stuff like this in the 60s, but then he didn't use computer but dice to uh, decide how dancers were going to move. No, no one ever compared that to me, but you're talking about chance techniques. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, no one ever did that. And for me, it's quite different because there's very little chance involved in this, except for perhaps the improvisations that the dancers did in the beginning, because as I said, Dawn absolutely sat and you saw the list of instructions there and she really wrote those out and it, it's changed, quite figured out, you know. Stuff, uh, trying to make it better. Sure, 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 yeah. So I think it's actually quite a different process. There's nothing random about it or no, no there's no chance procedure involved really. So, so it's five minutes of a five, 35 second loop continually varying through the edits, or not through the edits, through the um, patterns. And that is then learned by the dancer. Yeah, so the, the thing that you saw before, the one that I showed you that was yeah. like this with the edits in it, um, they would blow that up. We had we were, we had a great residency. We had lots of computers with really big screens, so they each had their own computer. We would just blow it up to full size. We had them all around the dance floor, and they would just sit there and look at the screen and do it over and over and over again until they got it. Yeah. Yeah, I have a question about this, uh, we talked about like, cinematic experience. Mm -hmm. um, not in 16 Revolutions, but in the other pieces. In the future of memory, yeah. yeah. Which, what do you 
mean by well, it's a bit unfortunate. I don't have um, I, mean, I don't I don't have any of the clips from Future of Memory that would probably give you. Oh yes, I do. I have one of the little clip that might give you an idea about what I mean. There was just a lot of imagery that was cinematic in its nature in that piece. You know, a lot of close-ups of different parts of the body and uh, things like that. Let me see if I can find you a quick example to make it a little bit clearer. I think if you saw the piece, you instantly know. If you saw all the stuff in the piece, you instantly know what I was meaning. But um, you know what? I'll, I'll, I, I don't know exactly where that is, but maybe I can find it for you later and let you see. There's no, in those screens. There were lots of instances where. Um, where we were, you know, using these images that were close up, because also the dancers would go to the cameras and do these improvisational speeches, and we'd videotape it. I mean, not it used the buffer actor that I owned oh, there, taught that today. Um, it would be caught into the computer, and then they would use the mini dance to manipulate what they had just recorded. Um, so a lot of it was like a close up of his face scattered across those many windows, and they were manipulating that image. But you know, the image of a close up, for instance, is a classic piece of film grammar. It gives us intimacy with the performer, and that's not, not something you can do when you're on in a proscenium stage, you know, feeling that closeness with the performer. So you have both. You have the dancer, and they're, they're down here dancing, and they're this big, and the face is like that big behind them. And you get both of those at the same moment. So to me, it's a kind of cinematic language. But also, just some of the imagery that was in it was cinematic. There was a little, um, uh, two minute, uh, I'm sorry, not even one minute and ten second long uh, thing that was an edited piece of cinema really that just kept coming back. It came back four times in the piece, except that each time it came back, it would have inserted into the middle something that had been recorded in the piece, so that by the end of the piece, it had changed completely into something that was now constructed out of materials from the piece. So. I wish I had a better uh, example. Maybe I can find this other clip and you can get a better sense of it. But I think that the imagery itself, to me, suggested a sense of cinema. Yeah? What are some of the parameters for like, the screen projection? Since you said that you know, using the back was always like, pretty much like, like, archaic or like, old-fashioned. Old so like, what are some of the possibilities where you could use that screen? I think that, that one thing talked about with the Ghost shadow, mm -hmm. that kind of starts going there. But what are those possible? Well, I mean, in one piece, I'll just, this I do have a clip of, and I won't play the whole thing for you. But in this piece, we had um, oh bugger, I don't know if you're that's not helpful. Stop. All right, let's play it like this. You can see these figures walking in, and. Um, Obviously, that's video. And so we had these uh, four objects on the stage. During the course of the performance, those were moved all over the place. And using it as a door, I could always put the image right inside of it. So that was one other way of approaching the image. And this was really going straight out of what we had done in Future of Memory, where we realized that having a human-sized screen allowed us to really see it as another kind of dancer on stage and to keep the focus balanced in a way. So this was the, the subsequent piece that we did after that. And I don't think, I don't have any examples of after they're moved. But like, and sometimes uh, what happens at one point, they're all laying on their sides, or some are like at an angle sticking on top of another one. So they actually, the, the whole piece is really a dance where the objects move from one side of the stage to the other side over the course of the hour-long performance. So that was another way of handling it. And then these screens that we have in Loop Diver that are perpendicular to the audience, I think it's quite an interesting idea because if you imagine these multiple screens, no matter where you're sitting, there's, you only see two. One of them ends up being kind of like a line. You never see all three of them. And this actually is very interesting because I'm not showing the same image on all three screens all the time. So where you're sitting in this uh, setup, you have quite a different experience of the piece. Uh, and not only that, because also some of the screens block the view of the dancers sometimes. So I, for me, that was an interesting one. But I mean, I think there's all kinds of, of options. I mean, you know, uh, Frieder Weiss's piece, Glow, I don't know if any of you have seen that. Uh, there they project on the floor. 
And that's quite an interesting choice as well, I think, because uh, because it's on the floor, when the dancer stands, you don't really see it. You're looking at her. But when she lies on the floor and the projection joins her, then she's absorbed into the image. I thought that was a very strong choice in terms of dealing with that idea. Um, and when I say archaic, I, I don't, I, or you said the word archaic, I don't know if I said that, but, but I think that I would say problematic. And it's problematic specifically for dance. Because, you know, where is our focus? You know, is it on those performers or on the imagery? I think you can make a decision to let it simply be on the imagery. That can be a choice. But, um, but I don't know if it's the choice that I always want to make. And, uh, yeah, I mean, we dealt with that in various ways in 16 Revolutions and other sections that I didn't show you. And I think it's probably worth saying there's significant sections in the piece where there's no media whatsoever. It's just dancers dancing. Yeah. Anything else? Yes. Uh, I don't know how difficult to set up a thing like this because that um, with the mini dancer, yeah, you know, the sensors and all kinds of uh, boxes you can buy or make or whatever else. But if you want to do it with camera tracking, then it uh, seems for me a quite difficult process if you not in a theater setting or something else. I'm looking from, from another perspective. Yeah, I think that. Um Certainly, any place that you can't precisely control the lighting, it's going to be almost impossible. Mm. I'd say almost. I don't know if it's impossible, but I think it's almost impossible. Um, I, I will say this. Using the camera tracking in 16 Revolutions was probably 10 times easier than using the MIDI dancer because it never broke. MIDI dancer broke, you know, every three performances that have to be soldering a new wire on. You know, everybody here knows this story. Um, you said it today. You said the physical interface part, the inter the, 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 you know, the, the, the sort of Making it structurally sound is as much of an art as any part of making these homemade or homebrew yeah. sensors or whatever. But there are ways of doing camera tracking, and I'll, I'll give you, I don't know if he has it on his website, but Frieder Weiss is a friend, and he did, a, he did a great thing. He got so frustrated with dealing with receiving performances and all the rigmarole with that. He bought a giant battery, and he got a, borrowed a truck from a friend, he put a video projector on it with his friend Emily uh, Sanchez, went out into the streets of Berlin and did street performances where he was doing camera tracking and projections onto just sides of little walls and buildings and things like that. And he would just drive the truck up and turn the projector on and they do these little things, very ad hoc. And he was really doing it. So you might go to his website, you might have some examples of these street performances. I thought they were very clever. And it was, it was nice because they were absolutely out of the environment that you normally see them in. Okay. Well, maybe that's enough for the moment. Let's yeah. uh, let's have a drink and take a break. And like I said, if, if you know if people are specifically curious about Isadora, we can just talk for a minute about it, or I can come over and show you a few things. But <coughs> thank you very much for coming. It was nice to be able to tell you about what I'm doing. When your your hot spots are too white, and then if you have too much exposure, then you get uh, lines. You sure? You said it was light from the radiator. That's what it was. <laughs> Dark. <laughs>